Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to attend today's presentation. Uh, my name is Andrew Schwartz. I'm partners with my brother Rick Schwartz in the CPA firm of Schwartz & Schwartz, based in Woburn, Massachusetts. Um, each winter, we prepare just over 2,000 personal tax returns uh, from G uh, February 1st through April 15th. The rest of the year, April 16th through January 31st, we work with about 300 uh, small one and two owner medical and dental practices, about 250 of those are dental practices, the rest are medical practices in a variety of specialties. So we're very familiar with the issues affecting everybody. And this year, whoo, there were a lot of issues. Uh, and the issues are still happening. If anybody applied for the, um, the HHS Provider Relief Fund Phase 3, evidently that money is hitting today. And um, it's a lot of money being paid out uh, to a lot of our clients and a lot of dentists and physicians and other healthcare providers throughout the country. So um, if you haven't checked your bank account yet, check it. You probably have a nice deposit there if you apply for phase three. Okay, so let's talk about um, uh, what's going on for 2020, some year-end planning issues. And um, in what we sent out, we implied there'd be some information on 2020, 2021. There will be some information, but uh, I'm gonna try to keep this to 45 minutes. So it's gonna be mostly on 2020. There is a lot to talk about. So for starters, um, for starters, let's talk about uh, the subsidies and grants. So there was a, a variety of ways that the government came through and they provided um, uh, people in all different industries, including healthcare, with a variety of sub subsidies and grants. And they're all taxed differently and have different requirements. So let's see what's going on. For starters, there was a PPP loan that, that came out right at the end of March. This was the first thing that they came up with. Um, and we, we've been through it. Everybody should be pretty familiar with how the PPP worked. But essentially, they said uh, originally that, that um, you needed to submit a certain information about your practice payroll, and they were gonna pay you for two and a half months worth of your payroll. Uh, and then when the money came, you had eight weeks to spend two and a half months worth of payroll, and they gave you some other facility expenses that you could spend the money on. Uh, they realized soon after that a lot of businesses were closed. A lot of businesses who got their PPP loan weren't open, weren't going to be able to spend the money. So they extended the um, the covered period to 24 weeks. So all of our practice clients had 24 weeks to spend two and a half months worth of uh, payroll costs and certain facility costs uh, and all that. So we're pretty confident that unless a business unless a practice really didn't reopen or, or open on a much smaller scale, pretty much everybody's going to get 100% of their PPP loan forgiven. Um, so when it comes to the PPP loan forgiveness, there is no rush. Uh, the rules are still changing. Uh, they're talking about coming up with another stimulus on Friday, which could include some more PPP money. Um, they're expanding the number of people who, uh, based on the, the size of the loan they got, who are gonna have uh, an easier time submitting the paperwork to get the, these PPP loans forgiven. And the deadline is 10 months following the end of the 24 week covered period. And the e earliest that somebody got money was the first part of, of um, April. So we have till July to send in the paperwork for your PPP loan forgiveness. There's plenty of time. Um, we, we can help you, we wanna help you in the spring. So um, uh, if you ask us to, 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 to help you with the paperwork now, um, what we're gonna tell you is um, no rush, the rules are fluid, fluid and the deadline's 10 months following the end of the 24 week covered period. The one exception is if you're selling your practice or um, selling part of your practice or selling some assets, um, you do need to get the PPP loan forgiveness filed sooner versus later because the PPP loan, it is, they, they do put a lien against the assets of your practice, I guess. So it's gonna be difficult to sell your practice if you, um, if you don't get the PPP loan forgiven, uh, but there are things that you can do. So um, no rush. All right, so, so basically when, when the rules were instituted back in March, when the $2 trillion package, um, the CARES Act was passed, um, the rule for the PPP loan was very specific. It said the PPP loan, when that's forgiven, even though cancellation of debt is normally taxable to the person uh, or to the business, for the PPP loan, cancellation of debt is not taxable. 
That is what the rules said. Uh, the IRS went to clarify this whole situation, and they basically said um, in this paragraph here that any expenses that are normally deductible that are paid with the um, the PPP loan that is forgiven, those expenses are not deductible for that year. Okay, so any expenses paid with the PPP loan that's forgiven are not deductible expenses to the practice. Um, so this is what they say, deductibility of payments of eligible Section 1106 expenses that result in loan forgiveness under Section 1106B of the CARES Act is also subject to disallowance under case law and published rulings, um, et cetera, et cetera. They're very clear about that. Um, so there is, you know, information out there that, that in theory, Congress, when they passed this rule, did want the, um, the forgiveness of the debt not to be taxable and the expenses to still be deductible. Uh, so this is an area that's, that potentially could still be changing. So um, stay tuned. The next issue that the IRS ruled on was, was when the, the, the expenses paid with the PPP loan that um, is forgiven, so when those non-deductible expenses are non-deductible. Is it non-deductible in the year the expense was incurred, or is it non-deductible in the year that the PPP loan is forgiven? So let's say you decide to hold off until 2021 to send in the paperwork to have the PPP loan forgiven. When, which year are you going to basically pick up income for the loan that's forgiven? And the IRS came out with a ruling actually pretty recently, and they basically said that if your intent is to have the PPP loan forgiven, then your 2020 expenses uh, should be adjusted. So the non-deductible, the non-deductibility of the expenses paid with the PPP loan that's going to be forgiven, whether the loan is forgiven in 2020 or 2021, if the intent is to get the loan forgiven at any time, your 2020 expenses should be adjusted accordingly. Um, they do go on to say that if in 2021 it turns out you don't get full forgiveness, you do get the claim of deduction either by amending your 2020 tax return or by by taking that on 2021. All right, so that's all I wanted to talk about with the PPP loan. We all we've been talking about the PPP loan since March 20 something or other, so um, we're, we're pretty good with that. I do want to point out that some people, not many, but some business owners did not get the PPP loan. And if you're one of those business owners and your business was either closed for a portion of 2020 or your income collections for the second quarter of 2020 were less than half of what they were the, the second quarter of 2019, you're eligible for this thing called the Employer Retention Tax Credit, the ERTC. And the ERTC is pretty valuable. It's basically a tax credit equal to 50% of the salary or the first $10,000 of salary paid to each employee who you retain, or $5,000 per employee. So it's a lot of money. Um, you get the refund by, uh, it's in connection with filing your um, the quarterly payroll tax forms, the Form 941. Um, so if you use a payroll service, uh, you're gonna wanna remind them that you didn't get the PPP and you're eligible for the ERTC and you want to make sure you get the maximum credit because your business was forced to be closed for, for some period of time uh, earlier this year, and you will get the money back either by them uh, recording it on that Form 941, the quarterly payroll tax form, or there's a second form that you can file called a, a, a Form 7200. It's a brand new tax form that you can find at irs.gov, and uh, you file the Form 7200, or you do the payroll tax forms correctly, and you get this really big credit, this, this uh, employer retention tax credit. And um, to be eligible, just to repeat myself, there needs to be either a full or partial suspension of the operation of your trade or business during any calendar quarter because of government orders, and that's every medical and dental practice in the state, I think. Uh, it's every dental practice. You guys were forced to be closed for a while. Or a significant decline in gross receipts, and that's if your collections for quarter two of 2020 was less than half of quarter two of 2019. And the ERTC is for wages paid through the end of this year. Okay, so that's the second subsidy. The third is um, the idle advance. So this is the first batch of money that people got. So so when this whole, when all this stuff, 
this craziness started uh, the middle of March. Everybody was closed. They rushed to do the um, uh, to put together uh, the CARES Act, and, and the SBA was very involved. They came up with this economic injury and disaster loan advance, and this went through a few permutations right off the right at, right at the get go. But they ended up coming up with um, an advance equal to a thousand dollars per employee for the first 10 employees at your practice. And as I said, they paid this out very quickly. People got this money uh, early in, fe in, in April. Now, so the EIL, the, the idle advance, unlike the PPP, which is income, and also the ERTC is income, uh, the amount of the credit, the idle advance is not income. So the idle advance, actually, if you got the PPP, the idle advance needs to be paid back to the PPP lender as part of the forgiveness process. Now, one reason I'm, I'm not having my clients rush to, um, to send in the PPP paperwork is I still think in the back of my mind that um, that they're going to they're going to change the PPP forgiveness rules and they're not going to require this idle advance to be um, repaid. Whether that's going to happen, I don't know. We're running out of time. But the whole time I kind of thought that would happen. I don't know. Maybe it's probably less than a 50% chance of that happening. But anyways, um, as part of the loan forgiveness process, you're going to repay the, the, the idle advance. It's not taxable income. So we're going in and we're fixing everybody's QuickBooks and we're putting the idle advance not, at, not on the profit and loss statement. We're putting it as a liability on your balance sheet just to be sure that you don't end up paying taxes on that this year, okay? And we, we did look into this recently, and basically, if you look at the instructions that the SBA has on the PPP loan forgiveness application, it specifically states line 11, which is the maximum forgiveness, it says, if applicable, SBA will deduct uh, the EIDL advance amounts from the forgiveness amounts remitted to the lender. Okay, so um, there was some uncertainty about that in my office, I know, but but we, we rechecked the rules, and based on our, our understanding of these rules that are still very, very fluid, um, it, um, it's our understanding, our understanding that this idle advance will need to be repaid, and it is not income to you this year. Okay, now people who apply for the idle advance, they also got um, access to a, a idle loan in emergency, oh, emergency injury and disaster loan. I think I said E-Ron before. Emergency injury and disaster loan. The loan was up for was up to $150,000. This also is not taxable income and this needs to be paid. Uh, a lot of the people we work with did get the idle loan. Um, I gotta tell you, if you got the idle loan, and you do not need that money, if that money is just sitting in a bank account, uh, just sitting there, and you're not overly concerned about um, uh, about cash flow for, for 2021, I really think you want to pay, uh, pay back the idle um, as soon as you can. The reason is the uses of this loan are very limited. Now, I've spoken to a lot of people, and they're like, well, I'm not using the idle loan for these things. I'm using other profits and I can show whoever wants to look at it that I'm using my profits for this whole list, which we'll go over in a second, and I'm not using the idle loan. Well, this, this idle loan is, this is like the last chance for businesses that are about to go out of business. It's the, econo the economic, I don't know if it's economic or emergency, I'll check that. But it's, a, it's, a, it's an economic injury and in, in, um, disaster loan. It's to keep you busy. It's the last lifeline for business. I mean, it's to keep you in business. It's, it's the last lifeline to keep you in business. So they don't want you taking money from your practice and paying dividends and bonuses or dispersing money to the owners over and above their salary or repaying principal or stockholder loans or expanding the facility, relocating, refinancing long-term debt, paying down uh, long-term debt. What... What these rules, the way I understand these rules are, is if you have money to do any of these things, the SBA wants you to use the money to pay off this idle loan. Um, so I, I understand the argument that people are making, but I think if you don't need the money, you do not want to keep this loan outstanding. Um, and it's very easy to pay it off. 
the idle is not a long-term financing solution. It's going to be a big headache to anybody who has it. Uh, complying with all these guidelines is going to be very difficult. Um, but it's very easy to pay off. You go to this website, pay.gov. You create a new account. You Once you create the account, you just put in your idle loan number, and then you just pay back the loan. A lot of people have paid it back. I think it's very easy to do. So, yeah, do yourself a favor. This is one that's going to bite you uh, in the butt uh, if you keep it out there. Okay, another subsidy that uh, healthcare providers got was the uh, Provider Relief Fund. Um, this you apply through your Optum ID. So, phase one was for um, was mainly for physicians uh, and other healthcare providers who took Medicare. Then phase two came along. At first, it was for, for physician, uh, dentists who took Medicaid and for physicians as well. And then it was ex expanded to all dental practices. Uh, mm -hmm. You actually do have the, um, the ADA to thank for this. They really did work hard on your behalf to, to open up some of these funds to dental practices. So most of our clients who applied for phase two, actually all of them, they got a payment equal to 2% of their 2019 collections. If they bought a practice, they, they could factor in the seller's collections. If 2019 tax returns weren't filed yet, they based the, 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 uh, the subsidy on, on 2% of 2018 collections. So, so people got a lot of money. Uh, then came phase three. Phase three originally needed to be filed during the first part of November. Then they changed it and they said, as long as you have the Optum ID, you have until the Friday after Thanksgiving to apply for phase three. In phase three, those payouts are, are being dispersed right now, and it is a lot of money. So if you haven't checked your business bank account uh, today, go in there and our, the clients who you know, have just a regular amount of income are getting thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars of this phase three subsidy. Um, so it's a lot of money. So the HHS, the Provider Relief Fund, it does not need to be paid, but it is a taxable subsidy in the year received. So it was all received in 2019. So if you look at the QuickBooks reports that we've prepared for you, you will see that um, that the HHA subsidy is a separate line as other income. Uh, on the profit and loss, it'll be taxed. So, um, the good news, actually this isn't good news, the bad news is, eh, the good news is you got the money. The bad news is there is some type of self-reporting that needs to be done for people who receive the Provider Relief Fund, and um, there is a filing re requirement. We have to go back on to the OptumID website, and between January 15, 2021 and February 15, 2021, you need to submit some information, which we're going to go over in a second. And if you want to see the rules, uh, here's a link to the website that has the rules that we're going to go over in a minute. So what we're going to do is uh, uh, in January, we, we meet with everybody to close the books. We're going, to, we're, going, we're going to provide them, each client, with the information that they need to um, be able to submit. Uh, this self-assessment or self-reporting to HHS. Um, if if you want us to do it, of course we'll do it and charge your fee to do it. Um, but it may be easier for you for us to do that, especially when you see how much money you're going to get for phase three. Okay, so here's the requirements. So uh, I'm just going to read to you. It's a lot of words on the screen on the uh, slide. So recipients will report the their use of provider relief fund payments using the normal method of accounting, and we're all cash basis accounting, meaning you record income when you get the money, and you record your expenses when you pay a bill, by submitting the following information. So first they want your healthcare-related expenses attributable to coronavirus that another source is not reimbursed and is not obligated to reimburse. Um, and you can include general and administrative or healthcare-related operating expenses. So we had a little bit of research to do on this. I'm not exactly sure which expenses they're looking for, but we'll figure it out. But I actually don't think it's that relevant because the second thing that we're going to report is the PRF payment amounts not fully expended on healthcare related expenses attributable to coronavirus are then applied to patient care lost revenues. So we've been doing the books for a lot of clients for our clients. We did during the summer, we had our summer meetings with everybody and now we're having our close the books meetings with everybody. 
I would say all but a few of our clients saw a decline in, in patient revenue so far this year. Um, and so I would suggest that anybody who got the um, the uh, HHS Provider Relief Fund subsidy, the amount that they got for the subsidies is less than the amount that their revenue decreased. So I don't think anybody's going to have a tough time doing their self-assessment and determining that 100% of their um, or the PRF should be um, okay or whatever they're going to do. And I don't know how they're going to do this. I don't even know how many millions of applications they got. I'm not sure how much how much manpower they have to look at all these the self um, assessment uh, uh, filings that that are going to be submitted. But then they go on to say, if you don't have enough, uh, if you if, if you're not able to fully expand your P, your provider relief funds. During 2020, they're going to give you an extra six months to spend the money, and then you need to do some more self-reporting, I believe, in July or something like that. So they're making it very easy for you to 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 tell them that um, the money you got should be um, fully uh, allowed, and and not and nothing needs to be repaid. Okay, then we get the Medicare adva advance. This didn't really affect dentists because de most dentists don't accept Medicare. But uh, any physician who, who took the Medicare Advance, originally um, the Medicare Advance was supposed to be paid off during 2020 by the practice um, providing services and then and then getting paid less from Medicare. Medicare did push back the uh, the repayment of the advance through services to 2021, and they did go on to say that if you um, if we're going to repay, I mean if you're going to repay the advance in 2021 by providing services. If you're not able to work off the full amount of the advance, the remaining balance is a loan that's going to be owed with interest. And because of that stipulation, um, anybody who got the Medicare advance doesn't have to pick it up as taxable income on 2020. Um, they're going to pick it up as taxable income on 2021 based on the amount that that they work off. And whatever's left over will be a loan on their books that they'll need to repay. Okay, so. Uh, any physicians or other healthcare providers out there with the Medicare Advance, make sure that's on your balance sheet. Treat it as a liability for 2020 as it's not supposed to be taxed. All right, then we got our friend, the FFCRA, the Family First, uh, whatever, <laughs> CRA. Okay, so here's a situation where, um, right, you, you had corona, they closed you down, everybody was furloughed, people came back. Now you have people working for you, and every once in a while, someone's going to be exposed, one of your employees, to COVID. And if, if, if somebody's exposed to COVID, then they're really not supposed to come to work. It's just not safe. And they have to either quarantine for 14 days or somehow be able to get a test and, and prove that, that the test comes out negative. But, but they're going to miss a few days of work. So basically, the FFCRA... Healthcare providers, in theory, don't have to comply with this if they have less than 50 employees, but there's no reason not to comply with it, um, unless you're worried that all your employees are going to take advantage of this. Um, so basically what they say is if you have an employee who is exposed to COVID, um, for, the, for the first two weeks following their exposure, you continue to pay their salary, and the government will immediately pay you back, the federal government, um, they'll pay you back by, by, by you reducing your payroll tax deposit with the federal government. So it's very easy to get paid back. Um, you just notify your payroll service that you, you are paying somebody's salary who can't come to work because they got exposed to COVID and you pay them for the, fir for the first 10 days, the first two weeks of work, full salary up to $511 per day. And then, okay, and that's it. So, that, so it's nice and easy. Um, employees ex exposed to COVID, you continue to pay the employee. Um, the government pays you back quickly for that for that um, for up to two weeks. It makes complete sense. Uh, people need money to pay their bills. People can't work if they have COVID. The federal government's trying to keep people able to pay their bills and, and financially in good shape. So what they set up uh, is a is a very good system to do that. There's a second part of the FFCRA, which healthcare, which which practices with less than 50 employees can opt out of. And that is if you have an employee who can't work um, because of lack of childcare, the kids are, are being homeschooled, the childcare centers have closed, any of those things. So in that situation, you have the option of paying an employee 
10 weeks, up to two thirds of their salaries, up to $200 per day. Um, same thing, you get paid back immediately by reducing your payroll tax deposit with the federal government. So you do get paid, um, but as a small healthcare practice, you are able to demonstrate that, um, that you rely on your staff person to show up to work to, um, because you need them to work because you need you don't you only have you know two three four five six staff people working there so you need your staff to come in and work so you do not need to do the second one so what we're recommending well what, anyways what I'm recommending is uh, the first part people unless they're really uh, opposed to doing so they they pay for the two weeks but the, the but then for the most part they opt out of the second option here. All right, so I was at a, um, a year-end tax seminar for accountants the other day, and this is something that I, I guess I read, but I forgot completely about, and I'm glad that the, um, the person teaching the class reminded me of. So, so this FFCRA, I talked about if somebody is a W-2 employee of your practice. What if, what if you're self-employed and you're the one who can't work, if you got exposed to COVID? So if you're, if, um, if you're self-employed, you got exposed to COVID, that same credits, the same tax credits, the um, the two weeks up to $511 per day. Um, if you're self-employed, you can take that as a tax credit on your personal tax return. That's how you get paid back. So you don't get paid back right away, but when we're doing your personal taxes this year, if you couldn't work a certain amount of days because of COVID, um, make sure we know because you can get, it's, it's $5,110 that the government's, um, willing to reimburse you that day uh, to pay yourself back. Uh, okay, so you claim it on your personal tax return. You can also claim the other credit as well of two thirds of your salary up to $200 a day if you're not able to work because your kid or kids need um, uh, don't have childcare or, or you're homeschooling or something like that. Okay, another subsidy is the social security match deferral. Um, this is not income to you. It's basically an interest-free loan from the government. So when you have people working for them, for you, uh, you withhold 6.2% of their salary for Social Security taxes, and then you as the employer match the 6.2%. So the government gets 12.4 cents in Social Security taxes um, for each dollar that an employee makes up to like 140000 or something like that. So uh, this was this, this, they came up with this early on, and any employer who is worried about cash flow can defer the Social Security match. Um, you have to do it real time, so this isn't something that if you pay the Social Security match, you can change your time, you can change your mind, <clears throat> and then later on uh, decide that you wanted to defer it. You have to do it with each payroll tax deposit, but if you do defer your Social Security match, um, you have half of it due uh, the end of 2021. And the other half is due the end of 2022. We actually had a lot of our clients, because this was only an interest-free loan, it wasn't a subsidy, and they were getting a lot of other subsidies, um, they did not take advantage of this, and, and I didn't disagree with that at all. If cash flow is tight, this is a great thing, an interest-free loan. Otherwise, it's going to come due pretty quickly, and the interest rates are so low, and, and there have been a lot of subsidies. So if you decide not to go with the Social Security match, um, that's pretty fine, too. Okay, lastly, we have unemployment uh, benefits. So for the first time in most of our clients' lives, they uh, collected unemployment. So real quick, when, you're, when you are a practice owner and you have employees, uh, you actually have an account. It's in quotation fingers because um, it, it's not an account where you can take out the money, but it's an account where they keep track of the amount of money that you contribute into the system each quarter and then the amount of money that is paid out to you and your staff, uh, um, which reduces your account. So your account is increased when you pay in, it's decreased when benefits are paid on behalf of one of your employees. Um, if, if your account decreases, you generally have to make that, make that money up and replenish your account by paying higher unemployment tax rates in the future, okay? So this would be a nightmare because everybody would have wiped out their um, uh, everybody would have completely wiped out their um, their their account with unemployment. Um, but the PUA that is not considered the employer's responsibility. And I'm pretty sure that I read that Massachusetts what, what was paid out in connection with COVID won't reduce people's accounts as well. Um, 
So hopefully when we get the new rate notices that are coming out pretty soon to, to show at what percent you're going to pay back your unemployment taxes into the system. In Massachusetts, you pay unemployment taxes on the first $15,000 uh, of salary paid to each employee. So we're going to find out pretty soon how much those rates are going up by. But um, hopefully it won't be too bad if, if these two statements about the um, pandemic unemployment assistance um, and about the, the state unemployment, whether or not the employers are going to be responsible for paying that back. We'll find out soon enough. But anybody who did receive unemployment, those unemployment benefits will be taxable. You're going to get a form 1099-G from the government. Or you have to download it in January and um, expect to owe income taxes on that. So what we've seen is um, uh, with this whole thing, um, when we're looking at the numbers for our practices, as I said, pretty much all the practices saw their revenue decrease uh, because they were closed for a couple months between 2019 and 2020. Revenue decreased, uh, overhead expenses decreased. So most people saw their profit uh, lower, but the profit wasn't lower by the full amount of their revenue reduction, but they had lower profit. And for most of our clients, that 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 reduced profit was made up with was made up with the uh, the PPP loan, the provider relief fund subsidies, the and the unemployment that people received. So most people's profit, most people's net income is exactly not exactly is very close to what it was in 2019, even though the revenues were much lower. So the government accidentally somehow came up with the right amount to reimburse healthcare providers and dental practices. So they kind of ended up in the same ballpark with their with their profit than they had um, before. Okay, so I know where I went through that pretty quick, but that's okay. That's an overview of all the subsidies um, and grants that most practices got. And um, and the government's actually gonna get back a chunk of it because it's a, a lot of it's gonna be taxable income to people, but it did help get you through the year. So let's spend some time on some new tax breaks that came out from the um, from the CARES Act. Okay, the first is um, practice owners can now pay their staff 2020 only. I don't think that this has been extended. Up to $5,250 to, to use to pay down their student loans. Okay, so um, it's called the 127 plan. You'd have to put in a 127 plan. And if you have employees or associates who are paid as W-2 employees who have student loans, uh, you can be generous and you can pay down $5,250 of their um, student loans. It's deductible to the practice. It's tax-free to the benefit. Um, what about the, the practice owner? Unfortunately, the practice owner or the practice owner's families, they can only benefit from 5% of the amount of that that's paid towards all these student loans. So essentially, for every $1,000 that you pay towards your your towards a staff member's outstanding student loans, um, the practice owner can pay a whopping fifty-three dollars towards their own student loans. So I do think I had a, we had a couple of clients who set up the one twenty-seven plan, and we have a template here that we could send to you. Um, uh, a few people did it. It's really very generous, especially when only fifty-three dollars when you can only do fifty-three dollars of your loans for every thousand dollars that you're doing for your staff's loans, but but that's that's something new this year, and I think it's expiring at the end of this year. But we'll find out on Friday if they're extending it um, when they come out with the new um, stimulus. Okay, Section 139. This is a big deal. This is this is a this is a good thing. So this came out after September 11, and basically they said um, after they 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 said if 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 you're incurring certain type of personal expenses, they're really personal expenses that generally aren't tax deductible and you benefit personally. If you incur those type of expenses, uh, which will enable you to continue to work, the practice can actually reimburse uh, you for those expenses. The practice writes off the amount that they pay to reimburse for the 139 expenses. Um, and whoever gets the 139 reimbursement that reimbursement is not taxable to them. So um, this is a great thing. So you can reimburse yourself and you can reimburse selected employees. So the employees who drive you crazy, you don't need to reimburse them. 
the employees you like, you can reimburse through the 139 plan. So you can discriminate with this when you normally can't discriminate um, with any of these benefits. So somehow you have to, um, if you want, you can figure out which type expenses that fall under the section 139 you incurred. Um, and the practice before the end of the year can write you a check uh, to reimburse you for that. So what are the expenses? So it's um, if you had any expenses in connection with, with setting up a home office, um, of, of maintaining a home office that you didn't pay for out of your, out of your practice that you paid for personally. Uh, a lot of people spend a lot more time working out of their homes, so that would count. Um, if you had to pay any money for tutoring or, or to hire a teacher or for, for, for childcare over and above what you would normally pay, um, if you had to pay uh, those expenses, the excess expenses that you paid, which allowed you to work, that would be the one that would count as 139. If you have a different additional mileage, if you personally paid for technology, for 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 internet access at home, any expenses that you incurred, which you which you needed to incur so you could continue to work, that's all the 139 expenses, and um, and that is um, it's a great thing. It's 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 tax deductible to the practice, not taxable to you when you get the check. And as a matter of fact, um, we have some clients who are using the 139 reimbursement as their bonus, as a Christmas bonus for their staff. So instead of paying them and putting it through payroll, they are figuring out an amount to, to pay their staff. They're going to call it a 139 reimbursement. They're going to write off the amount that they pay, and the amount paid to their staff would not be taxable to them. Okay, and the 139 expenses, I did have a slide on that. So um, so it's it's kind of vague, but it's to reimburse or pay reasonable and necessary personal, family, living, or funeral expenses incurred as a result of a qualified disaster. To reimburse or pay reasonable and necessary expenses incurred for the repair or rehabilitation of a personal residence. Um, and um, and then says if you got federal, state, or local government money in connection with a qualified disaster in order to pr promote the general welfare. I don't really know what that means, but if you did that, that money's tax free too. Okay. Oh. Okay. So then they 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 set up this rule too. They provided you with access to your retirement funds. Now I'm um, I'm not a huge fan of people before retirement age um, um, accessing their retirement funds. I think you need to look at your retirement funds as um, as precious. Um, you're going to need as much money as you can collect and accumulate over the years to fund a comfortable retirement. So if you don't need to take out any money from your retirement accounts during 2020, um, I recommend that you don't take out any money from your retirement, even though you can. But if you do need money for whatever reason, uh, this year they said you can take up to $100,000 out of your uh, retirement account, your IRAs and your 401ks and your other retirement accounts, penalty free, okay? $100,000, you won't owe the 10% early withdrawal penalty that people under the age of 59 and a half would normally owe. And this income, you don't you don't pick it all up in, in 2020. You will pick up the income rateably over three years. So if you took out the full 100000 you would pick up 33333 in income uh, in 2020, 2021, and 2022. And they do give you three full years to completely repay any money you took out during 2020. So, um, so uh, if you pay back a third each year, then you, you're actually not going to pick up any of this income as taxable. But if you, um, otherwise, if you um, if you pay back the whole hundred thousand dollars in 2020, 2022, you're going to have to amend your 2020 and 2021 returns to show that you that the thirty three thousand you picked up as income shouldn't be taxable. Okay, so if you need money, you can get money from there. They made it very friendly, tax friendly, um, that income. Uh, or it used to be that if you had a 401k plan, you could borrow $50,000 from your 401k plan or, or up to 50% of the balance in your account. They increased it for, for this year after the corona thing, where you can now borrow $100,000 from your 401k plan uh, up to up to 100% of what you of what you have. So you can take the full amount of your 401k plan up to $100,000 as a loan, and then you pay it back over time. And right here is a link to um, to this uh, situation. So 
if if money was tight and you needed to take to take money out of your retirement, there are rules that you need to deal with, and you do have plenty of time to take it to pay it back. If anybody did take the money out and they just got that that beautiful amount of um, the provider relief fund today, uh, think about paying some of that IRA or 401k money back. Lastly, charitable donations. The rule it used to be you could deduct uh, gifts of money paid to a um, to most charities, you could deduct up to 50% of your income. Uh, this year, you can deduct up to 100% of your income as a charitable donation if you give gifts of money uh, versus gifts of appreciated security. So, so I don't know what anybody who's given 100% of their income to charities, but but you have this year to be very very generous and get a big tax deduction for your charities. And they changed the um, they they did change the deductions. Um, the itemized deductions recently, uh, where more and more people are not itemizing, and they they put in this little rule. They said if you give at least $300 of money away this year, and you're not itemizing your deductions because you don't have a mortgage, and really, if you don't have a lot of medical expenses, it's very difficult to to itemize unless you give a lot of money to charity. So you can deduct a whopping $300 um, as a deduction on your tax return, even if you don't itemize. Okay, so those are the new tax breaks, and let's just, it's, it's a little bit before quarter off, let's just spend a few minutes on going over the uh, the huge, the usual tax breaks. Okay, and this is gonna be rapid fire because we talk about this all the year. The first is you wanna max out your salary deferrals if you have a 401k plan or a simple IRA. So a lot of people didn't get paid for the full 12 months this year, and they may not have adjusted their salary deferrals, so they're gonna max out their retirement this year. The maximum for 2020, is 19,500 uh, in 401k. Uh, if you're 50 or older, you can put away 26,000 as salary deferrals in your 401k. The simple IRA lets you put away 13,500 uh, in salary deferrals. If you're 50 or older, it's 16,500. And every year there's a maximum salary for retirement plan calculations. And this year, 2020, it's $285,000. So anybody who's gonna put away money in addition to the 401k and the matching contribution, if they're going to do a profit sharing plan contribution too, um, if they can get their salary to $285,000, it allows them to max out their retirement plan contribution without being too, too generous for the staff. The closer your salary is to your staff salary, the more you put away for your staff to be able to put away more money for yourself. And lastly, this year, the, mo the maximum you can put into your 401k plan is, um, is $57,000. If you're 50 or older, it's 63,500. So that's if you do the 401k salary deferral, the match, and you also do the um, the uh, the profit sharing plan, which gets you up to the 57,000. Okay, I promise you some 2021 stuff. Here it is. Uh, 401k plan deferrals and simple deferrals stayed the same. So in January, you wanna reset your deferrals to end up at 19,500 for your 401k. 26,000 if you're turning 50 this year or you're already 50. The simple is 13,500, 16,500 if you're 50 or older. And the one change is the maximum salary for retirement plan calculations next year is 290. So anybody who typically uh, wants to set their salary to, to, to hit that max, you wanna set it for 290. And the, um, the, uh, the, the maximum that you can put into your retirement plan is 58,000. Um, if you have a spouse who's either not working or is working but doesn't have access to a 401k plan at work, um, it, it might be a good idea to put him or her on your practice payroll and then pay them enough to max out their, their 401k plan. Okay, Social Security max. Uh, if you're wondering, in 2020, you paid Social Security taxes on the first 137700 Next year, it's the first, uh, first 142800 and watch out, Biden is talking about doing the donut thing where he's going to reinstitute social security taxes once people make more than $400,000. So um, so social security is something that's probably, the taxes that highly compensated people pay is something that that is probably gonna change with this administration, stay tuned. Okay, so if you have your own practice, a lot of people are paying their kids and they want to know how much they should pay their kids. And so basically, if you um, have a practice and you've been paying your kids, um, you want to pay them at least 6,000 
and that allows them to max out a Roth IRA each year. Having your kids pay into a Roth IRA when they're when they're still in your house and your kids is a great thing to do. I have clients who kids graduated college. They didn't need to use any of the Roth money uh, to, to pay for, for any college expenses. And they graduated, they had $100,000 in the Roth IRA already because they started putting away money when the kids were 10 or 11. Um, if, you want to put, if you want to pay your kids more than 6,000 each, um, in Massachusetts, the first $8,000 is tax-free that somebody earns. And for 2020, the first $12,400 is free of federal, of, of federal taxes. And if you have college age kids, because of the, of the um, American Opportunity Tax Credit or even the Lifetime Learning Tax Credit, you can pay a kid $25,000 or $30,000 and they, um, with the credits, they're probably not gonna owe any federal income taxes. Now, if you have a practice at the corporation, when you do pay your kids, um, you are going to pay the 15.3% Social Security and Medicare taxes on what you pay them. So you still are going to save some taxes, um, but these are the different limits of, of whether of, of the different of the state taxes, federal taxes, and all this stuff. But but if you do pay your kids, do yourself a favor and do them a favor and set up a, a Roth IRA. Um, you can do them at Vanguard. They they call them custodial IRAs. Um, there's financial planners. We work with those guys. Um, uh, First National, Jason and Alex, and they can help you set this stuff up. They're really excellent. And um, uh, but but go the extra step if you're going to pay them and do the Roth IRA. Okay, then you can pay yourself some rent. Most of our clients each year they they reimburse themselves for their home office that they use. There's a simplified home office calculation that lets you um, your practice reimburse you $1,500 a year to use your simplified home office. This is a deduction. I'm, I don't love this deduction, but uh, I, along the way, the, this rule where you could rent your home for 14 days and not pay taxes on the rental income you got, got twisted where practice owners are now paying themselves to use their vacation homes for, for marketing events or their home for meetings 14 days a year. And if, you, if, you, if you're involved in a self-rental situation where the practice pays rent to yourself for, for a space that you own, it's just a good habit to pay the highest possible rent. It takes the money out of the practice, it avoids the Medicare tax, money accumulates in this other account that you can take out every once in a while. So we recommend that our clients figure out what the highest rent is that they can pay themselves and pay themselves that rent. Okay, traditional IRAs. Uh, so typically this isn't an issue we discuss with our practice owners, but we do have practice owners that because of the, of the shutdown and just how crazy everything was this year, um, they decided that they're not going to contribute any money into their into their practice uh, 401k or simple IRAs this year. So if you're in that situation where you just never got around to to, to contributing your um, your uh, money into an IRA, I mean, if you contribute money into your 401k or something like that, um, then what you want to do is add um, six thousand dollars each for you and your spouse into a traditional IRA if your spouse isn't covered under the retirement plan, and at least you're putting away $12,000 this year uh, into a retirement plan. The maximum IRA is $6,000. If you're 50, older, 50 or older, you can contribute an extra $1,000, and you have until 4-15-21 to set up and contribute to an IRA for 2020. Then we have the Roth, for Roth version of the IRAs. Again, typically this wouldn't be applicable for most of our practice owners, but you know, if you really had a tough year, your income might be low enough where you meet where you blow these thresholds where you can put money directly into a Roth IRA. And if that's the case, um, I want you. Uh, if that's the case, you might as well try to put some money into a, a Roth IRA. Sure? Okay. And then there's this thing called the backdoor Roth, and that's when people can take their their current retirement money. And contribute that money into a um, into a Roth IRA. So you do pay taxes when the money goes from your 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 IRA or other retirement account into a Roth IRA. But if for whatever reason you really had a very difficult year with your practice and you're going to have very little profit this year, or you ended up taking a, buying a bunch of equipment, expanding your practice, opening a practice, uh, buying a practice this year later in the year, and you're not going to have much profit. That might be a good year to take some of your money in your regular retirement account that's growing tax deferred, which means it's going to be taxed later, 
and switching it over to a Roth IRA, and that money grows tax-free, meaning uh, it won't be taxed later. It, it's, it's, you, when you take the money out when you retire, there's not a dime of taxes that are owed. It's, a, it's a, an opportunity that I think you want to be aware of, and between now and the end of the year, which is only two weeks away, um, if you think your income is going to be much lower this year than it has been in the past and will be in the future, I think you want to um, uh, consider a Roth conversion. Okay, it's it's pretty complicated, but right on the bottom it says it does it make sense for a 2020 Roth conversion. You are going to want to work on that next week. You're going to have to figure it out and do it next week. In health savings accounts, more and more of our clients are, are moving towards a, a qualified high deductible health insurance plan that allows them to set up a health savings account. Um, and so with a health savings account, it's it's just like an IRA. It's a separate it's a separate account where you put money and you can invest the money. So um, if you have a qualifying high deductible health insurance plan, you're able to either, you're able to put money into the HSA and the money you put into the HSA is pre-tax. It's, it's tax deductible money goes in, the money grows tax deferred while it's in the, uh, the HSA, the health savings account. There's no requirement to take out the money every any year. It's not like a flexible spending account where it's a use it or lose it. It's an account where your money's growing. And then you can take out the money at any time, tax-free, to um, to use to pay for your family's medical expenses. So it so it makes complete sense in, in today's environment, if your family is reasonably healthy, to take a look at whether you can find a, a decent a uh, high deductible health insurance plan that allows you to contribute to a health savings account and look at these great things. It's the only investment I know that allows for tax deductible contributions and tax-free withdrawals. Uh, and if you do have a qualifying high deductible health insurance in place, you can put away $7,100 uh, into it this year if you're married and $3,550 into it if you're single. Uh, you can do it at Vanguard. Fidelity has HSAs. Um, Alex from First National and Jason, uh, they can help you set these things up. They're, they're really quite good. Uh, just a few more slides here. The, the college savings plan, 529 plans are great. You can put away $15,000 per year per donor. If you're married, your wife, your spouse uh, can put away the same amount of money. It's non-deductible money that grows tax-free. Um, it's it's used for college expenses. You can take out $10,000 a year for K through 12. However, the beauty about the 529 plan is to have time for tax-free growth. If you take, if you put in $10,000 and take out $10,000 the next year, there's not going to be a lot of growth. And they also changed the rules where you can take out up to $10,000 in total for student loans out of 529 plans. So 529 plans are really good. Um, and I guess that's uh, that's everything that I wanted to cover. Um, so there, there's a few more slides, but um, that's okay. Uh, what I want to say in, in summary is the last part of your planning is you want to do whatever you can to save taxes this year, but I think we're in a situation where tax rates are rising. Everybody thinks that. So, so accelerating expenses or deferring income this year might actually cost you more taxes if, if, if tax rates increase next year, so you want to keep that in the back of your mind. Um, we'll have to see what happens. I guess we have to see what happens down in Georgia. Um, but even so, tax rates are probably going to be on the um, on the increase. Uh, so factor that in with your planning. Uh, that was a lot of information. Uh, it seems like most people stayed on for the, for the whole time, which is great. So once again, we appreciate them. Uh, the opportunity to be able to, um, if you're clients of ours, to, to, to work with you on an ongoing basis and hopefully help you keep up to date with all this stuff and, and do what we can to help you understand your practice numbers, your overhead, um, manage your profits, manage your taxes, try to do things to save some taxes. So I really hope, um, I know we're trying to do everything we can to do those things. I hope I hope we are, uh, we're coming through. And with that being said, um, uh, Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, to, to try to, to serve you and try to uh, to do the best we can.